Good afternoon, Namaskar. A very warm welcome again to the 16th edition of Japan Literature Festival, protected by Dittal Baninga Swast India at Darbar Hall. First edition, Mystics and Septics. Namita Gokhale, Sharing Tashi, Alka Pandey, Ranjit Hoskote in conversation with Pragya Tiwari. Mystic and Septics, a tribute to the mysteries of Himalaya, edited by Namita Gokhale, is a uniquely insightful anthology traverses, which traverses the sacred geography of the Himalayan range, encompassing different cultures and religion and other tradition in its living legacy. Through myth, legend, and the anecdotal memory, it includes narratives of the wanderers and seekers, gurus and enlightened souls, tricksters and delusionists, including Guru, Guru Millerappa, Neem Garuli Baba, and Siddhi Ma, and Paramansha Yoga Nanda, Swami Rama, Guru Nanak, Swami Vivekananda, Haida Khan Baba, Eshe Shogya Lal Ded, and Sri Madhav Ashish. Also discussed are the sacred traditions of the Dhuni and Chimta, the Shakti peaks in the Himalayan region, trans runners of the Tibet and Bhutan, and the Khasi rituals of divination and prophecy. Namita Gokhale, let's welcome Namita Gokhale, is the author of 21 books, 11 works of fiction, and editor of numerous anthologies. She's also the co-founder and co-director of the Japan Literature Festival. She has been recognized both for her writing and her commitment to the multilingual Indian literature and cross-cultural literary dialects. She was the Sahitya Academy Awardee for 2021. She has recently been honored with Neela Marani Sahitya Samman 2023. Sharing Tashi is a writer known for his works in the field of creative nonfiction. In the last two decades, he has authored numerous books on Bhutan and has made country's rich history and its diverse culture interesting, accessible, and engaging for the youth. Tashi is the co-director of the Bhutan Echoes Literary Festival. Al Kapande is an art historian and ex-reader of Indian arts and aesthetics at Punjab University. Pande is a creator, arts manager, prolific and extensive writer and winner of many prestigious and highly coveted awards in India and abroad. Ranjit Haskotti's collections of poetry include Vanishing Acts, Central Time, Jonah Whale, published in UK as the uh, Atlas of Lost Beliefs and Hajj Prose. His next book, Ice Light, is due from Wesleyan University Press and Penguin in Spring 2023. Haskate has been honored with numerous awards, including the Sahatya Academy Golden Jubilee Award. So over to N. Pragya Tiwari. Pragya Tiwari, she's going to moderate the session. Pragya Tiwari is a strategy and culture consultant, creative director of Ojio Media and co-founder of the Indian History Collective as a, gen as a journalist. She has written extensively on politics, identity, policy, and culture, and has edited several publications, including Elka, The Big Indian Picture, and Vice. Over to Pragya. Am I audible? Okay, I think I am now. A very warm welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I am very, very grateful to be part of the launch of this very, very special book, Mystics and Skeptics. Um, this book introduces us uh, to uh, mythical as well as factual accounts of mystics and uh, mystical traditions that are rooted in the Himalayas. It's a map of um, the wonders of the Himalayas, if you will, and a testament to uh, how utterly unfathomable and diverse our spiritual traditions have been and still are. Um, on these pages, you are uh, likely to meet uh, skeptics, saints, seers, philosophers, and hopefully come away 
with um, many new ways of uh, imagining and uh, thinking about the world that we perceive. Uh, so first of all, Namita, congratulations and welcome on putting this together. Congratulations on putting this together. I wonder how you um, sort of navigated the landscape of the subject, because it's vast, and it's also very close to your heart, and what you make of the book now that it's done and out there. I'm absolutely honored to have been involved with this book. It happened with a life of its own, as these things often do, and uh, they are all of us on stage, but in the audience, there are so many people who've contributed so significantly to the book. I can, the lights are glaring. I can see my dear friend Makaran. I can see Navtej. I can see Siddharth, the artist who had so much to do with it. And there's Divyangi. So all these people have very different perspectives. Just to give the audience a sense of the range of how to encounter the holy, the sacred, and sometimes the unholy in the mountains. So, um, Divyangi. Um, Divyani has written about her father, Swami Rama. Uh, and then there's an essay by him. So, it's, it's a juxtaposition of the inner life, the outer life, the material life, the lived life. But to give a sense that those holy personages who lived in the Himalayas or who live in the Himalayas, their quest is quite different from the quest of those who are in the more, um, in the different life of the plains. And, the, you know, many of us here go to the mountains and we feel a different vibe there. When we go there, we are looking for, maybe we are closer to heaven or to earth, whatever, but there's a sense of transcendence there. Whereas here, the Hinduism also that is practiced, among other things, in the plains has more to do with seeking the goodwill and intercession of the gods to make a material and comfortable life. Whereas, except when you reach the last stage of your life. Out there in the mountains, it's a quest for uncharted territory. So that's what they've all talked about. So Vivekananji's travels in the mountains, uh, Guru Nanak's extraordinary piece by Navtej on that, uh, the piece on the very strange Lal Baba, and the illustrations by uh, our friend uh, Siddharth on that, or Divyani's whole story of her father, which shows us the family life of a uh, uh, extraordinary saint, or oh, this, my friend Sharing Tashi, whose piece is so short, but it has so much to say about the trans runners of Bhutan and how they run, what makes them run. So it's it's happenstance, and uh, I have no logical explanation for why these things come together. The readers can string them together in any order they want, or any disorder they want, because this book seeks disorder. It's beautifully put. Um, Ranji, you know, taking off from what she was saying, your essay, in a sense, is a uh, testament to the multitudes that the Himalayas contain. Because, it's, of course, it's about Lal Deri. You've been translating her poetry forever. But uh, it's also, you know, sort of, it weaves in um, Buddhism and, uh, you know, Sufi mysticism and yoga, yoga and tantra and, uh, you know, all of that. And I was just, uh, I was just wondering how you take such a large life and such a large scope and, uh, you know, make an essay out of it. So what, what would you say is the thrust of your essay? Uh, thank you so much, Pragya. And I have to say it's a, it's a very particular privilege to be part of this anthology with uh, this amazing array of uh, colleagues. And I say this also because in looking at the life and work of Laldeh, and having studied this for over two decades, it came to me very clearly that we are looking at a historical personage, for one, but also centuries of contributors who, although anonymous in themselves, have, under the signature of the saint, brought their own experiences to this quest. So, Laldeh, to me, is both an individual and a group portrait, if you will, of a Kashmir that has gone through various uh, periods of uh, spiritual quest, religious practice, but in the box of Lalla, 
you have precisely this celebration of uh, different ways towards transcendence, whatever the particular names and forms might be. So the essay comes from the introduction, and to me it was really, a, as a translator, as someone looking at this material, it was a long apprenticeship in humility. And to look at the qualities of endurance and resilience that this, this work, these poems, these, this, this sacred poetry actually conveys to us. So that, that would be my response. And uh, if all of these other, uh, if these various religious traditions come into it, because that's the nature of that journey. It points us towards confluence, not, not a hard-edged singularity of what spiritual, uh, what the spiritual quest can mean. It's a beautiful and complete essay, um, if I can use that word. But uh, coming to you, Alka, yours is a very it's a beautiful personal essay because it's, it's about your relationship with the Divine Mother, but also in ways your own mother. Could you tell us a little bit about why you chose the Shakti Peets that you do write about, um, the three Shakti Peets that you choose to write about? So I'll just begin with an invocation to the Devi. Sarva Mangal Mangalye, Shive Sarvartha Sartike. So this is actually a book for the believers and the non-believers. I want to first begin by thanking my friend for many years, Namita Gokhale, who I've known for more than 40 years. And what I keep marveling is the way she, you know, brings a huge meta-narrative to an idea. And when she spoke to me about mystics and skeptics, I actually didn't know the range of people who would come into this book. Um, I never asked her, so that's my fault. But when I started writing, I did want to get back to her, and then she just gave me a little idea of some of the people she has, because hers is always a work in progress and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So I decided that, you know, there's nothing more what I would do as a person, as a child of the mountains. My ancestry goes to the mountains. I thought, let me just write about my own relationship with the eternal goddess. I come from a family which is a shark family. In our homes, in the days gone by, there was actually a, 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 a kind of a bali done to the gods. We are meat-eating Brahmins, so any child who was born, there was the sacrifice done and the blood of the animal was put on a six-month child in the Jwala Mukhi, which is known as the peach of the flaming mouth of the uh, mother. And it was all very symbolic. Now you don't have those sacrifices anymore, but you have a metaphorical, allegorical sacrifice of a, of a big pumpkin, the white plate have been cut and the sindhood being put. So these are all metaphorical things. But coming back, it was a very immersive kind of experience which I had with the Devi, with my very patriarchal, very controlling father who would recite the Chandi uh, on the Navadurga, on, on, uh, on the day of, for, for years I've heard him doing it and he kanthithe unko, so he knows it by heart. And I saw my mother as a very strong woman who really held her own with my very patriarchal father. And I actually saw her as the Shakti of the family. We, we were four sisters, so my father was the only male in the house who was asserting himself even more and of a generation which was really very, very strongly masculine. And I see my mother who in her own way, who was a musician, who was a poet, who was a scholar, who never really asserted herself, but it was she who held the family together. And there's my father who's doing all the rituals of prayer, and there's my mother who reads the Devi Bhagavat regularly and tells me that the world is not different to what it was in the times of the Bhagavat, in the times of the Puran. The same kinds of... Uh, uh, problems with women, the same kinds of human uh, desires, the same kind of human failings, they were all there in the Quranic stories. And as I was growing up, I never did pay much heed to that. But in the last 10 years of my life, I actually understood 
what really Shakti is. By watching my mother, by watching my patriarchal father, by watching the relationship between the two, and seeing both of them worship the goddess, and how the distillation happens. In the mountains, as Namita would know herself, there are various stories. You know, it's full of stories and myths and legends. And you will see all the hill women are very strong women and our Kumauni women. They are, you know, you go to, to, to walk in the mountains and they will look at you straight in the face. You go to Himachal, they'll immediately put a parda if a gen man is walking. But in the Kumau, I see the presence of the Devi everywhere. So when we started talking, so Namita just said, write what you feel. And I just wrote, right from my heart, about a very tradition-bound, ritualistic family, a family of believers. And I don't have just blind faith. I see it in the modern contemporary woman today. I see every woman as a Shakti. I see in empowered male Shakti. It is that energy which drives. And she has no gender. She's beyond gender. And all the, the Trimurti, they pay obeisance to her. And that is the, and it is not a feminist aggressive way of saying it, but just a very deeply reflective, reflexive, powerful energy, which is present both in men and women. Perfectly put in this essay, you will obviously get to learn more about the Shakti Peets, and particularly the three Shakti Peets, Kamakya Devi, Rala Mukhi, and Nana Devi that Alka writes about. But Tashi, over to you. I mean, I haven't really, I, I mean this, I haven't stopped thinking about your essay from the moment I read it. Um, you write about your uh, elusive search for trans runners. Could you tell us a little bit about the practice and how you came upon it? Uh, Thank for having me here. Himalayas, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Himalayas, mystical mysticism and uh, inexplicable things occur often. And one such mystery is the, the belief in people with extraordinary skills who can walk long distance in relatively short span of time. They are known by different names in different cultures and different countries. In Tibet, they were known as the Kangjo, which means the fast walkers. In Japan, they were known as the Sen Nichi, and they earned their title after walking 8,400 kilometers just in 100 days. In Bhutan, they are known as Nung Gompa, or the people who ride the wind. Uh, today, the Western world has termed them as trans runners. Sorry, can you tell us about the trans nana he knew? Absolutely. I was going to ask you about, you know, how you came close to it, but not quite. The secrets of it. So, 1% of the total population of Bhutan are either monks or nuns. You have more temples than shopping malls. If you're in Bhutan, you're not far away from a monastery or a monk or a monk or a reminder of Buddhism. For a monk in Bhutan, it's customary to do a three-year, three-month, three-day retreat. Many, many monks choose to repeat. Some choose it as a way of life. And they have earned the name Ritrava, or the Great Hermit. So, currently, a survey is done. It's being conducted. We're not sure of the total number of Great Hermits, but we feel there are close to 100 such Hermits. My first encounter with the trans runner uh, was was about 20 years ago in uh, in Bhutan. This monk was at that time 70 years old, and at that time I was a young athlete. I played basketball, a lot of football, and when I went to drop him to his monastery, which was at 4,000 meters, he left me uh, behind and panting. And uh, trans runner, the subject of trans runner in Bhutan is not discussed in public. It is a tantric secret teaching passed from masters to students. But, however, in the defense, they said, if you demonstrate pure motivation, that these masters are willing to teach you how to do trans -running. Thank you, Tashi. Namita, um, back to you. You write um, um, about something that's very close to your heart. You write about your spiritual guru and, of course, Siddhima. Now, there are many things that can be said, but I, I wonder to your mind, what is the essence of the life and legend of Neem Karoli Baba? See, my relationship with this 
person who is called the quantum saint in Silicon Valley, of all things, and is considered the patron saint of Silicon Valley, is as a Kumaoni, because for us Paharis, he is uh, like a brotherly or a fatherly figure in every home. Anywhere you go, you will find a photograph. Any Kumaoni home, you are likely to find a framed photograph of Neem Karoli Baba wearing his blue plate Burberry type of blanket. And uh, I grew up like that and I was just, I was a skeptic rather than a mystic. I had seen him when I was a young girl and I was not impressed. Here means Neem Karoli Baba, but I did, I just found it nothing, it had no impact. Many, many years later, there was somebody who was a devotee of Neem Karoli Baba who came home. She's from Australia. And she kept saying, oh, I feel I am Hanuman, and I climb on the roof of the temples I go to. I found her so funny. I laughed and made fun of her. And it's after that, for about one year, wherever I went, literally wherever, I would find a photograph of Neem Karoli Baba. And it was also, he was calling me almost. Next time I was in Nenital, I said, okay, I'll come and uh, see this thing. And there was something about that ashram the Kanchi Ashram, I felt very happy there. And you don't always go where you're happy. And I've got great happiness out of it. I feel that Neem Karoli Baba is my friend, my guru, in that way, that in a casual way. It's not some deep religion or anything. And I did have a guru, uh, which was Swami Chidanand, who was one of the great saints. He, he was very close to our family. And I discovered that Neem Karoli Baba unlikely um, was very close to Chidanandji. So it's just something which I cannot explain, I cannot rationalize. I, many people in the intellectual world are afraid of saying these things of faith. It's considered somehow not very woke or not very uh, cool to say that you have a guru or you have a baba. Or you, you know, there, there, there's a little disclaimer to it. There's no disclaimer. I've received a lot of affection from unknown places in the universe and I accept it gratefully wherever it may come from. So this book was my book. Um, the essay is also about Siddhima who you've actually spent more time yes. with. So a couple of words. About. So um, Neem Karoli Baba had a successor called Siddhima who I knew because she grew up in Nenital. Our house was a house called Primrose. Down the lane there was a um, Alka Hotel, India Hotel, Everest Hotel, and she was associated with both Alka and with, she was the Bahu of those homes. And my mother remembers her as this young woman who, from the day she was married into this family, spent uh, all her time in the mandir, and she was charming, beautiful, always cooking, smiling, helping people. And then she became the saint. And, uh, you know, the only way I know how to pay homage to anybody or anything is by getting a book done. So she, in turn, had a Siddhima. I, I accidentally spent over five or six years, uh, one week at a time, just sitting in silence with her. In fact, for her, the moniker was sometimes the silent saint. And uh, then when she passed on, then she had uh, somebody called Jaya, Prasad, who was her, you know, who was her devotee for 37 years. So I had been pushing her to write a book. So that's how, the only thing I need, know how to do. So she has written a book on Siddhima, which is not here in the festival, but it's such a beautifully written book. And so Siddhima entered my life in the material world. As, and I loved what this ashram stood for, which was no religious ideology. It was feed, love, and uh, just calm. There was, it was not, uh, Christians were told to worship Christians, gods. There are no gods, the Christian God. I wish they'd also said Mother Mary, but they were told to worship uh, Christ. And it was, it, it was, it's a very deeply, essentially spiritual place. So that's my essay. But for me, I, I can, because I may not go on and on talking about this, this uh, I love the Himalayas. I love all that is sacred in them. It means an immense amount for me. This, doing this book, reading all these essays, 
for me was it like a tutorial i mean i did it for selfish reasons i did it to learn and frankly now that the book is done and i've learned from all these essays i'm still going to reread it and ingest what i've learned and the fate of the book is in the hands of all the great masters who are in it uh, or the skeptics and all that but i've learned from the book and i'm grateful for that we are going to um, go on to officially launch the book in a minute but before i do um, i'm sorry for catching you unawares but would you indulge me and uh, recite your favorite lal deer poem or anything that comes to your mind can i read a translation <laughs> rather than the original i mean i could have also read the original uh Laldet who is known to Hindus as Laleshwari and to uh, to Kashmiri Muslims as Lalarifa has really had this I mean she was a 14th century mystic and as i said a little earlier um, there is a tradition that has been active in her being which is why i think it's a contributory lineage not only a single person uh, to me she really represents what is best in our confluential syncretic traditions what is most robust and resilient about about Indian culture and Indian spirituality. Yeah, so I could do, do things now. Ami pan so daras na vichay slaman kati bozi dey mian meti dey tar amin takin ponuzen shaman zov chum brahman garagatsa. It means I can't remember my own translation now, but I'm going to improvise. Um, It is really an invocation to a divine who is not immediately named but a request to be carried across the great ocean of being and then there's a very very artisanal image that says am i just a broken pot from which the water is seeping away so you have within this bark this fall line verse there's an image of the great ocean of being and the individual is a possibly broken pot from the water is seeping away and to me it's this quality of being able to imagine in a visionary way the vastness of the universe whilst also looking at the vulnerability and limitations of the individual it's this constant interplay that, that really gives uh, gives that very particular distinctive character to the, the poetry of, of lala and this is what i want to really i mean this is the thought i, I come with it's the courage the endurance i mean you speak of the trans runner in a way that athleticism of the spiritual quest is something that i would hold on to on that note i just want to say a yeah, clap for that ranjit or sherry this thing of endurance the mystical path is a path of endurance more than anything it's not of some divine revelations which may come and go it may be a dream which may be a fantasy it's endurance and that's what i feel it is well on the note of endurance may i please invite some of the other absolutely incredible contributors um namita has already spoken about their essays but we have navdeep who's written about the uh, mountain sojourns of guru gobind singh and guru nanak dev we have uh, makrand who's written about vivekananda and of course devyani who you heard about earlier who's uh, written about her father the great seer swami rama uh, and siddharth whose illustrations you will find on the pages of this book uh, please uh, come up and help us unveil the book I'd just like to thank Namita for putting this wonderful anthology and such different voices together and uh, really to tell all of you that not that because I've written just buy the book and experience both the skeptics and the mystics that's the way of the world
Now that the book is uh, officially launched, um, the, it's, the copies are available. You heard Alka, I would urge you to go and buy copies. But in the meanwhile, uh, we have some more time. So it would be great to include you in the conversation now. I'm sure you have stories, questions. Um, please join the conversation. Put your hands up if you'd um, like to ask our speakers something. But before we do that, there's a video about the book. So can you please... Okay, the, play the video silently in the background. Yeah. Perfect, over to you guys. Is that, do we have any questions? I'm sure there's, there are a couple of microphones. Any question there? So, I asked a similar question to John K. Uh, he was talking about his book on the Himalayas. So, uh, basically the question is that, do you think living in the hills, do you think living in such a, uh, such a geography, the altitude, does it have an effect on uh, someone's perception? Not in the way, like it would change your lifestyle, but it would affect your subconscious and then in turn affect your imagination. What he said was that, yes, that is true, and it actually was the influence for uh, the Tibetan culture, to, for the ima imagery that they came up with, the dragons and every other mythical creatures that they came up with in that location. So do you have similar ideas? What do you think about it? Sherry, would you like to state this? I mean, anybody can, but okay. I think the geography of any place that you live in has a very, very strong uh, kind of influence because if you see in the far east or you go to Kamakya, it is the place where the goddess's vagina fell. So it's dark, it's mysterious, you kind of go down into the cave, there are the waters. You look at the Ma Sharada Peet or you go to Jwala Mukhi, it's on top of a mountain. These are all mountain goddesses or sthalapits as they are called. But everywhere where the geography changes, the rituals change, the climate changes, perceptions change, the myths change. So everything depends on the location. That is why sthala or sthan becomes so important in any ritual or any belief. So that's how it is. So if we are looking at the Himalayan region, you will definitely see there is a continuity, but there is also very, very strong differences as well. And as you keep moving, it is slightly nuanced and it becomes deeper and deeper and the change, like between Bhutan and Kumau, we have a very, the, the spirit is the same, but the imagery is very different. The perceptions are different. The immersions are different. So experientially and immersively, it becomes different. It's a sacred geography. And there's a piece on Swami Rama, which was about the Valley of Flowers. And that talks about altitude. He talked about altitude. And it's about how in the Valley of Flowers, the combination of the altitude and then the thousands of flowers that are blooming there, it actually gives you a high and it starts giving you delusions because the it, it can also fool you, the altitude and uh, the thinner oxygen. It may give you visions which may be real or not real. This is the skeptic speaking. Thank you, Namitaji. Just as I asked you a question. No, yeah, no, just, sorry. 
very brief note, which is that, uh, I mean, as many of you know, the Himalayas are regarded as the third pole. And I think even as we celebrate this incredibly sustaining heritage that we have from Himala Himalayan spirituality, we have to be aware of how that these geographies are under threat today. Uh, with the, exactly the, and that's something that I think as people respond to these themes and questions, we need to be really aware of in a very anguished way that we're celebrating something that is deeply vulnerable and might actually vanish in the next 50 years. In fact, the last essay by Vedhav Kaul talks about Alden Lamo and the anger of the goddess and the protection of the goddess or the goddesses, who are the emanations or the symbols or the real living beyond symbolism of the sacred geography. Um, Over to you. Thank you so much. Namitaji, thank you. You've actually answered half my question. But uh, uh, the entire Kumau, Garhwal, the entire range, is reverberates with its Devumi. There is so much of mysticism, and I've recently, probably after working so many years, got into it. My question to um, Sheringji is, uh, you spoke about trans runners. Is there any way uh, a normal person can also seek to uh, probably uh, learn it? And uh, next one, a very short one, Amitaji, you spoke about a lot of holy things happening over there. The entire Dev Bhumi is the most beautiful place to be in. It's a different feeling altogether. You spoke about holy things and unholy things. Thank you so much. While Bhutan has the last trans transrunners, we don't have any school. The only known school of trans trans transrunners in the history of the Himalayas is in Tibet. I don't know if uh, people have watched Seven Years in Tibet. There's a movie where Brad Pitt, uh, the actor is Brad Pitt, and it's based on an Austrian mountaineer called Hendrik Harrier, who befriends uh, the 14th Dalai Lama and lives seven years in Tibet. And in his book, Beyond Seven Years in Tibet, he mentions about the uh, trans-running school. He says it's in Shula Gyampa, between Shivatsi and Gyanse, and he describes how trans-runners train. So physically, they run on grains. They also have highly accomplished masters who come and teach meditation techniques. And every year, the greatest people is chosen uh, to run from Shula Gyampa to Lhasa, which is about 100 kilometers in one day without eating, drinking, and resting. And at, at the end, they are honored as a great yogi. I think it's unlikely. I, I don't think you'll be a trans runner. But what I read, there's another essay in the book about trans runners. And what I read is it's not about running, it's about pacing. Is that right? They walk fast. And I've often wondered how Adi Shankaracharya walked across those four dhams. I mean, he must have walked and walked and walked and walked to go to Kedar, Badri, Jagannath Puri, Kashmir, South India. So it must have been some form of accelerated walking that was both a spiritual exercise and a physical exercise. Now you said holy and unholy. So what I want to say is that what is unholy? often comes from what is holy because all the great spiritual learnings and blessings that hover around the Himalayas may give people some siddhis or some strengths or some delusions of being some gurus and that is unholy because a certain humility and a certain uh, proper behavior is needed for holy people. But uh, when uh, Often in the mountains, you get somebody who gets a chance to use what they have learned and to, to distort um, spiritual realities, and they get away for a while. Well, it's both amusing and ugly. Um, there's the, the two questions here. Please do. I have a question about uh, the title. Why skeptics here? Because what you people have spoken is all about mystics. You'll have to buy the book and to read it. <laughs> there are at least four essays there, but the skeptics sadly are not here uh, to talk about their essays. But they are written by people who, it's about disillusionment, because um, absolute faith can be one of the most dangerous things in the world anywhere. 
and uh, there has to be rational questing for deep mysticism. And some of the essays, when you buy the book, uh, you'll find out. You'll find yeah, the skeptics. Skeptics <coughs> also form a very strong force today. But skeptics, I believe skepticism is important for belief. So it's not anti-skeptics. There are some deeply treasured pieces by skeptics. Also, I don't know if mysticism and skepticism are always that antithetical. I mean, even in, for instance, I just confine myself to my part of it, uh, with, with Lala, you find that she's profoundly skeptical of... Uh, people who exert a monopoly on belief, pro professionals. Uh, she keeps referring to what I render as priest man. There's a questioning of uh, people who create these monopolies on how you may believe, what you need to practice, and as a solitary, wandering woman practitioner, you see the force and energy of this voice, which is on its own quest but is also very aware of what might curtail that quest. So in that case, skepticism there is a, is a very reasonable way of opposing things that impede the spiritual quest. If I could add to that, for example, uh, one of the towering figures uh, with two essays on him is Guru Milarepa. And the songs of Milarepa themselves are nothing but skepticism because every form of ritual or of uh, unquestioning belief is uh, gently mocked. Uh, ma'am, I'm from Tiruvannantapuram, steep down in the south. I was wondering, ma'am, would you consider writing a sequel on Kerala which steeped in mysticism and skepticism and states beyond the, uh, beyond the Vindhyas, below the Vindhyas. Now we have concentrated on the north. You could seriously consider well, that. I only write about what I know about. So that's why, but I agree with you that Kerala is steeped in mysticism and skepticism. But I often feel that even political figures or political ideologies uh, lead to some sort of, uh, not mysticism, but of a rigid um, uh, that's that's right. Right. structures that need to be dismantled. I agree with you. So why don't you do the book? I'll help you. Right? Yeah, I promise you. The book. <laughs> we have a question up here in the front and there over there at the back. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I bought many books here, but I think this book is calling me and uh, Many questions will be answered in this book. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. That's wonderful. Thank you. Back there and the gentleman over here as well. Thank you so much for sharing such wonderful insights. Uh, I have a two-part question. One is I've been to Bhutan. And I've seen that unlike what we tend to do when we deify saints and we put them into a box and say they are the special souls who are evolved, in Bhutan, morality and putting the other person before you is a way of life. And that, to me, makes it vibrationally a very, very interesting space, given the times we live in. The second question is about Tantra. A lot of Tantric traditions are associated with the Himalayan region. And I remember seeing the Museum of Tibet in Dharamsala, where there are a lot of these uh, recreated sort of tantric rituals that were being enacted through model dolls. They were actually like little setups with dolls. Um, how alive is the tantric tradition? And also, it is very mystical innately. We do not understand the alchemy of tantra most of the time. We just hear it as a concept. So I'd love to hear thank more you. about Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Would you like to take the question? Since we're running short of time, I'll sum up your answer in a few words. In Bhutan, when Bhutanese pray, we say, Madam Kadam, Madam Kadam, Simche Thamche. May all sentient uh, be beings be happy. So for us, self is not important, and uh, throughout our life, we pursue uh, to ensure that we benefit all sentient beings. Just to add on the bit on Tantra, would you yes, say that? I, or can I say one little bit on Tantra? Then uh, uh, Alka will answer her questions, but before the question, but before I forget, uh, a lot 
of the common um, traditions across the Himalayas come from the ancient Bonpa religions. And uh, from the, they say that they came from Siberia, a lot of the shamanistic traditions. So Siberian shamanism, Bonpa traditions, they inform, uh, I'm told even many of the Muslim traditions, certainly the Hindu traditions, certainly the Tibetan traditions. And they are dying out, but they are not dying out. Uh, so, we are definitely a very plural society from pre-modern times as well. But Tantra is basically, I would say, um, I don't know uh, if I should call it an offshoot or if I should call it a part of Shaktism. Uh, it is very much part of the ritual of the Devi worship. And there are specific areas of Tantric cult in India which are known as centers. And one of the most um, architecturally what you see are the Chausat Yogini temples. They are very, very important and you have them in Odisha, you have them in Madhya Pradesh, you have a great one in Jabalpur. And Tantra, one of the most important Tantric sites is at Kamakya. So these are very, very important centers of Tantric worship, rituals, where, where the mantra and the tantra are very central to the body. And the body becomes itself uh, a part of the embodiment of the Devi itself. So tantra by itself has a lot, whether it, it stems from paganism, shamanistic, but it is definitely a cultic aspect of Devi worship. Anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, just a brief footnote, which is that even the basic rituals that many Hindus practice today, what you might do in your domestic, we might do in our domestic shrines, uh, they all reflect a certain uh, tantric practice. It's only through the, what I have to call a certain Victorianization through the 19th century that it became conventional to see tantra as unorthodox, somehow dangerous, menacing, sinister. Uh, for centuries, it's been absolutely part of mainstream ritual practice and the spiritual quest across everything you might describe as the Hindu tradition. So today if we decry Tantra as something weird and strange, that only reflects the degree to which we've been Victorianized. Sharing, would you like to add something in Tantric Buddhism? Okay, okay, okay. Well, we have about six minutes, uh, six seconds left, so I won't be able to take another question. Uh, thank you all for being such a wonderful and patient audience. Again, Wow, that was loud. Uh, the book is available. And Namita is going to be, a lot of her other books are available. Uh, so um, they'll be in the author signing area outside. And you can get your book signed and perhaps have more conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olvi. Thank you once again, Namita Gukhle, Shirin Tashi, Alka Pande, Ranjit Thoskote, and Pragya Tiwari. And while we are giving this scarf to the authors, look at the AVVR playing the credit AV for the book, which was published, edited by Namita Gokhale. Thank you. Thank you for being here. There is.